Good evening, everybody. I, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to you all and thank you for joining us in celebrating the publication of the City Works. Uh, I'm Ian Latham of Right Angle Publishing, and uh, it's been my great pleasure, or I should say our great pleasure, because uh, this is, a, as editors, it was a joint effort between myself and Chris Voges. Um, it's been our good fortune and pleasure to work with Eric and Jose and the studio of what we see as a significant book. Significant because it looks at what can be, I, I believe can be regarded as the most intelligent and sustained investigation into the nature of the urban office building for very many years. The workplace is a building type that in the UK, with a few notable exceptions, pre-millennium, uh, such as one thinks of Foster's Willis Faber and Peter Foggo's work at Arab Associates. But the type had become somewhat moribund with formulaic solutions seemingly churned out and, as Jonathan Surgisson says in the book, overly deferential to fiscal interests, he says politely. <laughs> Eric Parry architects are serious, artful architects. The type of architects who perhaps 50 years ago wouldn't have wanted nor perhaps had the opportunity to dally with the hard-nosed world of commercial real estate. But clearly, clearly something has changed since then. And this has allowed the practice to some extent to take a lead in this sector within London. And they've done this primarily by engaging with the complexity of building in the city. The idea for the book was first mooted many years ago in 2014. And at that stage, there'd been six projects on the, the completed in this series. But by 2020, it had risen to 10, and that seemed about the right number to call a halt and get the book out. Um, those 10 buildings completed in the last two decades. Um, they represent a significant part of uh, Eric Parry Architects' work, but by no means the majority, as you well know. Um, within the book, the projects are print presented in chronological order, alongside essays written on their completion by different architects. And many of those essays were um, commissioned originally by Chris Foges and I, and even Mark Swenderton and I, going back to when Edward wrote the first one, um, as editors of Architecture Today magazine. And for the book, we added in three additional extended conversations with uh, Eric, conducted by Deborah Saunt, Bieber Dow, and Vivian Lovell. So, whereas the building critiques provide a, an outside, outsider's perspective, the conversations with Eric uh, examine the intentions of the practice. So there's a, there's a sort of uh, a balance between the two, we hope. We're hugely grateful to all the contributors for all the time and effort they put into writing and dedicating themselves to the project. And it's their words that form the structure and give the character to the book. Um, the building critiques naturally reflect the preoccupations of the writers as the, while, they, while they're discussing the buildings. Um, I think within them you can also learn something about the individual writers and their architectural priorities, um, which I think gives it an, an added interest. Um, all of them are distinguished architects and critics in their own right. And I think it's a mark of the high regard with which Eric Parry's work is held by the profession that such an interesting and wide-ranging thoughtful responses have been evoked. And it also reflects the practice's willingness to encourage scrutiny by its peers. Now, Eric, of course, I will need no introduction from most of you, but we're very pleased tonight to have Edward Jones who's agreed to offer some thoughts about the works and more. Edward, as many of you no doubt know, is a distinguished architect, teacher, and writer. Within the book, there's a page of biographies of the dozen or so writers, and it's no disrespect to the others that Edward's extensive CD, CV was the hardest to condense. For much of his career, Edward has worked alongside Jeremy Dixon, and Dixon Jones' projects pertinent to today's discussion include King's Place, which is nearby of course, ac across the other side of um, the King's Cross Central Development, 
and also Quadrant 3 at Piccadilly, um, a project for the Crown Estate, which, like uh, Eric Parry Architects, One Eagle Place nearby was also Crown Estate, not to mention the Dixon Jones work at the Opera House, National Portrait Gallery, National Gallery, and Somerset House, which many of you, with which many of you will be familiar. Also, particularly pertinent is the fact that Edward is co-author with Christopher Woodward of the Guide to the Architecture of London, which is still, in my view, unequaled in its comprehensiveness and pithy opinions. And that's gone through multiple editions and is now available as a free-to-download app through the auspices of the Architecture Foundation, and I'd encourage you all to, to seek it out. Edward, as I said, was the first contributor to the book as a writer on Finsbury Square in March 2003, when, as I said, Mark Swenerton and I were editing Architecture Today. And the project really set a marker for the standard of buildings that followed. And I think we'll, we'll turn to look at that project later in the evening. Um, so to start the conversation, I thought I'd pick out a few comments from the, the various writers' pieces within the book. Um, at risk of taking them out of context, and ask Eric and Edward occasionally to respond to what the, the writers have said about the particular buildings. Um, but if, in the during the proceedings, if anyone has any burning questions or thoughts that they'd like to um, express or questions they'd like to ask, do do please feel free to interrupt. We want to keep it fairly informal. Um, so, first of all, I picked out a piece that Bob Allies wrote about five Aldermanbury Square. And he said, in, in Parry's work, the significance attributed to making has always encouraged respect for the process of construction and, more significantly, a concern to represent that process directly, if not literally, in the building form. So if I can pass that over to you, Eric, that there's a sense that a number of buildings investigate particular materials and or construction methods as a key driver. And I wonder if you could talk a little about how that arises. And, and perhaps in which projects it's, you feel it's been key. Yeah. Um, OK, uh, so there are some that are, uh, are perhaps more explicit than others. Um, I suppose this building, I must speak about. It was 14 years in the making. Um, we were asked to, uh, to provide a, an idea for this site um, in a charrette, which was very much to do with uh, the ongoing discussions about the outline planning commission for this. And I, I registered uh, where we were located as a kind of key. Uh, on one side, one had these wonderful warehouses on the other, the gasometers raw and part of many artists and architects kind of work. So the backdrop of the industrial uh, landscape, and I'm, I, I don't want to post-rationalize because one, one's just drawn into this. Um, I was very much aware of artists like uh, Leon Kossoff, who had made many drawings around this site. There's a rawness. I, I had friends who were squatting in, in some of the buildings here that I used to visit. Um, it was raw, this place. And, and so with that industrial past, um, and with my good friend Albert Taylor, who may or may not be here, we sat down and started thinking about it. And I, I, I registered that the landscape was warping and that actually we needed to create a kind of sense of order so the exoskeleton became kind of manifest, and this idea of a, of a virendal, which would allow the, the ground to come into this space, which spans 25, 27 meters and, and carries the entire weight of the front, uh, and a belt that wraps around the building that point came. So I suppose that's one example, not to go on at length, of a kind of of, of, a, of a sort of image of place, a past, a future, a material, um, certainly not the first architects to use Corten or weathering steel at scale. I think I'd even been in Chicago minus about 10 doing a survey of, <laughs> so, you know, at some point in the past, you know, and uh, so 
uh, it doesn't break ground in that respect, but it is, it is something to do with industry and, 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 and actually, you know, the fabrication of this thing up in Bolton was the most fantastic joy. So I would just say this is explicit in its structure and its material. Finsbury Square was um, because there was a determination not to use stone as bathroom tiling, but to use it for what it is, you know, incredible capacity to bear load. Um, so that's another example. There are others that have a kind of more the sort of sense of a glove uh, um, and the material uh, on the outside, but always a sort of, uh, yes, a, a, almost a, a sculptor's interest, if I may say, and I, I have a huge respect for my sculptor artist friends, you know. Um, uh, I mean, we were doing the, uh, the studio for Anthony Gormley when he was dreaming about the Angel of the North, and there was a kind of full-scale maquette of a knee in our space, which tested the scale, you know, and that, that sort of materiality. So, you know, I mean, and uh, many others have been incredibly influential in the way one has worked and thought about materials. Mm. Enough. Mm, fabulous. Edward, do you want to add something to thoughts about materials? And well, um, um, what I'm aware of in Eric's work is um, no consistency, i.e. one building follows another quite unlike its predecessor. And I find that quite an interesting aspect of your work, Eric, my dear. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, uh, and I think it was some aspect of your <coughs> um, how can I put it uh, diplomatically? I mean, you, you have always described yourself as an outsider, and, and that, and not wishing to join, join the fold, so obviously. So I think there is a tendency in the work to want to keep experimenting, stick, uh, continuing to think this is an opportunity to do something. But for instance, the core 10, the stone, the glass blocks, the render. I mean, all these buildings have different materiality, and I find that uh, it's very distinct, distinctive of you. Um, comments? Well, yes. I, 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 I think uh, we are drawn to a place, and the resonance of a place. I think. Sorry. The first thing to, to say probably is actually that um, in, 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 a, in a long wandering of architectural education as a student and then as a teacher, um, uh, th th there's a sort of uh, a covering many different schools of thought. So although not in a fold, you know, influenced by, you know, um, the, the context of those great kind of educational cauldrons, you know, wonderful. So, um, so there's something of, of, of a lot of difference from art schools, actually, and architecture schools, which I think mark that will to not to be on one line. And then I think there's a, there's a sort of, uh, a, there was basic instinct and interest as a culture of many, not myself, um, with, uh, with, within the world of uh, the European cities, so Joseph Rickworth, Dalibor Vesely, and others, that meant one, one started to kind of uh, try to divine from the place what the place required. So that, that's my answer. No, no, that's what I'm saying, <laughs> but I think one of the things that Eric isn't in this book is Stockley Park. Which, which, uh, hello? Sorry, yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, speak closer to it. Is, is Stockley Park, which distinguishes you again for, for making your project relating to the park. And none of the others do. That they're, they're, they're kind of hermetically sealed things, whereas yours has a general sense of reaching out to the park and making it a building in the park. And I think your relationship to context is, is impressive. And uh, I salute you for that. But many thanks. Unfortunately, Stockley Park isn't here. I think it's a very elegant project. 
there are a couple that probably aren't, and, and Stockley uh, precedes this work, and it, because it's parkland, you know, and because these are in urban settings, we, we kind of, and, and, of course, uh, these are purely the works that Ian, Chris, and, uh, uh, you know, had, had agreed to publish. So, so Stockley was well before, I can say, you know, um, Architecture Today, even, I believe. Just, just about, 1989, I think. Yeah. Right. Okay. The book's astonishing. I wrote my article 19 years ago. <laughs> I mean, I mean, extraordinary. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the business of time. Yeah, the business of time. Well, at least we're not uh, landscape architects waiting for the trees yes, to grow, so you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, here, here's a good one. This is Patrick Lynch on... 60 Threadneedle Street. I think Pat is Pat Patrick, Patrick here? Yeah. No, we, can, uh, we can quote him then. If, if architecture is to develop beyond the mutually antagonistic discourse of theory on the one hand and commercial opportunism on the other, then this building at Threadneedle Street offers another paradigm. Parry neither refuses nor entirely accepts the plight of modernity <laughs> and the lessons of postmodernism finding a third way between the nihilism of both. Perhaps starting with Edward. Now, some of your buildings have been described as postmodern. Is that something you recognize in them or reject or no. tolerate? Jeremy and I, I'm pleased to see Jeremy's here. Oh, I'm pleased to see Jeremy's here. So, so we <laughs> might be able to share this um, uh, difficult question. Um, um, I think we have both, speaking for both of us now, had a, a, a great respect for history and the enjoyment of history. And there was a biennale which was called The Presence of the Past, which Ken Frampton refused to have anything to do with. It became highly political. Um, I forget the name of the chap who was running it in Rome. Um, I mean, in Venice. Okay. Portuguese, yeah, who, who was an arch postmodernist. I mean, and the competition won one in Canada was, uh, has become a kind of talisman of postmodernism. In, in fact, Charles Jenks even put it on the cover of his book. This is a city hall in Canada. And Jeremy's and my work in London has always been highly referential to the context, particularly the Royal Opera House and um, other projects. Somerset House um, is working with a modern idea in historic setting. And I rather like that frisson, that, that buzz you get from the one working against the other. And I think in that sense, I would say we are not postmodernist in the Jenksian sense mm. uh, at all. Uh, I hope that's yeah. um, conclusive. Jeremy, is there something you might like to? Yes. Thank you very much. Is it working? Yeah. Okay. Ed, yes. We've had this, I think we feel, accusation of being postmodernists going on for some time. I would like to defend it in a different way. That is, if you find a period of architecture difficult to handle, in this case, what was happening post war in public housing and such like, you have to take a stand. And the stand I think that we took was to look at the city as a historical model for a way of relating buildings to life in general. In other words, you, you take your lessons from the history of the city. That's very different to just making shapes because they might be fun. It's actually doing things that have a motive to repair an understanding of a continuity of, of the city as a, a living Thing. So my defense of postmodern is, is that we are not modernists, but we're not the kind of postmodernists that I think Charles Jenks tended to evoke as enjoying a kind of joke with architecture. I think our position, I hope, is not too serious, but is relatively serious. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, so Uh, 
Eric, I, I think you haven't ever been accused of being a postmodernist as such, but picking up on Patrick's point, do you see yourself as looking at it for a third way that neither accepts modernism nor postmodernism? Uh, yeah, well, there was an accusation, and there are some, there are some whiffs, as a critic there, put it. There was a project <laughs> for SSL with Doug Clarence for a long time. Uh, yeah, <laughs> well, that, that, that is, that, but I'm, I'm actually thinking of an AA, um, AA project, uh, ah. yeah, yeah, um, which was kind of, uh, was published in, in an anthology of that post-war period at the AA recently. So, yeah, it was said to have a whiff mm -hmm. of postmodernism. I think that uh, I, I think that the sort of reading of architecture um, with a depth of uh, history and theory is something that um, you know I, I underpins uh, at least an interest, if not it, it, it is evoked in the work. So that 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 interest in reading uh, architecture as a continuity mm. is very very important. I, I would kind of, I would sidestep the style issue. Um, and, uh, you know, I think uh, the, the question of figuration and uh, its part in visual culture is, is an incredibly uh, powerful one that's, you know, constantly under review if you think of the cycles of abstraction and figuration, um, which might be said to represent parts of those two worlds mm -hmm. and and is a lively kind of part of the debate as one as one sits to to uh, yeah think about uh, about uh, the ramification and I suppose we're talking uh, yeah about interiors as well as exteriors but exteriors on the whole and I suppose one could come to a project like Piccadilly Eagle Place and uh, and and discuss something of its background in 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 a in a passage that would be closer to one of those uh, than say this building is to the other. So, um, yeah, it's uh, I think probably I think Patrick's probably very accurate. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, while well, we're on One Eagle Place, that's just something that, um, there's a, where is it even? Yes, One Eagle Place, Simon Alford wrote about, um, describing it as a variegated container of uses, architectures, histories, and technologies that challenges our thinking on the relevance of use and on the aesthetics of the constricted facade, a project which the architects are testing themselves and their audience, both lay and professional. Do, do you think it's an architect's role to challenge thinking in that way? And does Eagle Place set out to challenge perceptions? Yeah, I think I'm always interested in, in the fact that we have two projects within a stone's throw, one at, in St. James's Square, um, and the way that, that that is part of the square and the sequence of the square and its history, and then Piccadilly, which was, you know, has, has an amazing brashness in terms of the architecture. You know, it's, it, it's part of a sort of a cycle of leases that come up and of rebuilding. Um, and people actually, uh, it's amazing how, how, how little of that kind of difference between the earthiness of the base of buildings and the aerial quality of the upper parts of buildings are appreciated. But if you, you know, it actually, a walk down Piccadilly is the most incredibly mm. intriguing, uh, looking above one, is the most incredibly interesting um, passage because the amount of invention there is phenomenal. So for me, Piccadilly uh, was both about being close to the circus and the history of that place in terms of London um, and not eschewing, you know, the, the modernity of, of advertising and lights, and it was about the reflectivity, and, and I stood, you know, and coming down the street, you see that double order, and you see those cheeks, but 
the building will be remembered above all for the very difficult uh, rite of passage, which it was for me an, an, an incredibly interesting one, uh, with Richard Deacon, mm -hmm. working where we both had to, to get out of a comfort zone um, because we had to find a way of the ceramic working you know, out of the body of the building or his material, you know, and, and so there was, a, there was a really interesting journey. In the end, I think that's the most brilliant cornice. You know, I think it's an amazing piece. Um, it's surely not to everyone's taste, and I, I, can, I know there are lots of mutterings behind my back, so I'm, I'm happy and ease, at ease with that um, as, it, as it kind of beds in, and... <laughs> Uh, but I still look up there, that polychrome, because the, the whole point about the building was to, to use a, 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 almost like a jug white as a base for a polychrome, you know, exploration, which his, his 39 steps, as they are, I think answers quite, quite brilliantly. Anyway, so that, that my opinion is that, that we are just, as in several of the projects, just the, the, the vessel to allow visual artists to excel. On the involvement of the arts and architecture, that um, Daniel Rosbottom about Savile Row spoke about how the space that the architecture, in many ways the building I think is the one the most well-mannered of many of these projects. Um, but, and Daniel Rosbond talks about this, how the entrance kind of, be, he says, becomes a kind of votive niche at an urban scale, a space for sculpture. They're, they're Joel Shapiro's evidently massive bronze form seemingly floats in the space. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it, but it's, it's an extraordinary uh, occasion along the street. Um, and was, could you talk a little bit about how that came about? And that yeah, with great pleasure. I mean, it, Vivian Lovell is here, and Vivian and I have a you know a long-standing kind of mm -hmm. uh, uh, communicative um, role on projects. Sometimes, um, you know, from her commissioning and knowledge, it's phenomenal. Sometimes one just feels there's something you know, that's right. And with the constraints of that building, um, actually before, before the, the project uh, was underway, I'd come across a small exhibition of Joel Shapiro's at Timothy Taylor's gallery with these maquettes dancing off a wall and went down with Tim and, uh, and Joel, sat in front of the building, the old building, yeah. English Heritage Headquarters, and um, thought about what might be. And that was the beginning of a six-year journey through two ownerships. Uh, really difficult to persuade the second owners that it was the right thing to do. Um, but that's one example where the constraint of the building needed something to dance. And he was exploring this idea of, of, of falling or suspended figures for many historic reasons. And so that was the first suspended piece he did. Yeah. And he, he's a most brilliant craftsperson and maker and thinker um, and conversations about things like pattern, of, you know, they're, they're, they're memorable. So there's a complete joy at the end of the process, um, apart from delivering building. And then, of course, after that had happened, not before, House and Verth decided that that was gonna be their HQ. So the building, like Richard Deacon's or Stevens' work, you know, becomes known for the sculpture. But um, uh, on on that on that occasion, it now has a kind of iconic quality. Not in not because of the architect, the architect is very quiet, um, but because of the fact of the, the brilliant sculpture and also the fact that this this amazing gallery that so many people go to for different shows. So. You know, it's another example, actually, of a, of a social role with architecture and the kind of animation that architecture can provide as a framework for social engagement, which I think is really an exciting part of the process. Okay. Um, Louisa Hutton on Fen Court. Um, 
Friend Court, you, some of you may know, has a five-story crown on the top in dichroic glazed, dichroic glazing, which uh, is, is a very striking aspect of the building, especially from a distance. Obviously, with, from street level, you're not so aware of it. Um, and Louisa Hutton describes this as an adventurous flirt right at the border of good taste. But that clearly extroverted attention-seeking nature of use here can be fully justified. How, how do you go about deciding what is on that border? On the, and you're not going transgressing the border. It could, it could have been a lot livelier if you'd gone to see the mock-ups. <laughs> and I couldn't quite believe we were getting away with it, actually. I, 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 it's another moment of real fear, um, being in Augsburg, you know, kind of looking at this mock-up, which actually was intensely bred, mm. <laughs> which I think would have been... Because what we were trying to do is obviously sign the fact that there's a public garden above, knowing that the buildings around are going to get higher, and there's this cadaverous, horrible green... Uh, glass that consumes the city, um, you know, and glass doesn't have to be boring, as we all know from great artists who work with glass. So, you know, it it was actually um, a actually it was it was calmed down, it, you know, um, but it does still turn people surprisingly green in the street. And so, the garden, the garden, and the the kind of uh, the sense of of color there, um, and the faceted nature of it throws, but it's never for long, you know, it's like, it's a sundial, okay. so, you know, it is fleeting, um, but I, I think if, if uh, it's, it's just like, there was no, no planning permission for Richard Deacon's Corners, there was an artwork persuaded, you know, there was some, some you know, but um, actually, one's behaving with the building, but actually some of the materials allow one to, to deviate and quite a lot, because that was, I don't think, ever anticipated in its intensity by the planning department. I, I, I'm sure there are people from, uh, maybe from the Corporation of London here, listening to this with horror. So, <laughs> but anyway, no, I think it's a joy, and it's actually rather nice to be in, in, inside, you know, kind of, it's warming. Um, anyway, yeah. flirting uh, with Edward, the irresponsible. Can, can buildings cross the boundary of good taste, do you think? And is, it, is that a, should you edge up to that boundary or should you sometimes cross it? Well, there's a great confusion in my mind about good taste and bad taste. I mean, there's a great advocacy presently for bad taste but, but because it, 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 it rubs up those pious people who mm. believe in good taste mm. and so on. And, and One's aware of that as a debate in English life and English society. I, I don't think it's quite so prevalent in, in European culture, mm. where there's a greater belief in, in the sanctity of the city, whereas the English have a great ambiguity about the city. They try and run away from it and go to their cottages. You know. can, can buildings be too polite? I think they can. Yeah. But I'm interested in, in Eric's preoccupation with the sundial in, in architecture. And you introduced to me the word skiography, which I then had to look up and understand what it meant. Um, sundial, basically, uh, which number 30, um, uh, Finsbury Square, you describe as a big sundial. And at Pembroke College, Cambridge, you introduce that word again, which I think is, I find that very interesting in, in that it's an absolute idea about the sun and how it affects surfaces, um, which is nothing to do with taste. Um, it's, it's to do with physical reality of things, and I like that a lot. Um, I've never managed to do a building that involves that concept, but it's, it's kind of in the back pocket, I think. Anyway, um, should one make some concluding remarks? Or, or you yes, perhaps, perhaps turn, turning to where it all started, and that, or in, in terms of the book anyway, 30 Finsbury Square. Um, many of you know, may know that 
was considerable opposition to the building from the outset. Um, but I think in retrospect, Eric has said that it was actually the, the sort of vehement opposition that helped with the project. And do you, do you want to just say a few words about how that, how you regard the planning process as being a positive? It's a sort of Faustian pact, isn't it? It's, it's you know, without planning, I, I think we would be set adrift in a terrible way. You know, and so my full backing to the planning process, the consultation process, the, the role of conservation and historic England. Um, uh, however, we have had you know, many run-ins with conservation officers. And the conservation officer responsible for the project at Finsbury Square said one, the one building that needed to be, and Richard Coleman is here, who, to whom I have to say, you know, without his, uh, without his help, this wouldn't have happened. And, it, you know, it was an amazing kind of five to four vote in Islington Town Hall in favor uh, with a, a, a chair a planning committee had, had, uh, had, uh, had left. Um, anyway, you know, the conservation officer was over my dead body. I another, another, who's since written about how good it is, actually. It's really <laughs> ironic. And, and, then, and, then, um, and then, you know, there's another example, not an uh, office building, which was uh, famously, for me, resonant, which was a response to the presentation, which was, lose your dream. And um, so, and it, it goes on, I won't bore you, but you know, so there is this dual kind of aspect. It's a, it's a wonderful part of the process, I think, that in, in response to Ed and the European city, where uh, German cities, where everything is so prescribed, uh, you know, it's very difficult to, to, to work uh, at the edges or, 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 or break the mold a bit, so which may be part of the, the sort of sense of responsibility there. Um, so, I think yeah. I would say it's it's a it's a it's a, it's a very interesting duality and a very very necessary one, very important. Edward, as, as you said, you wrote about Finsbury Square almost twenty years ago, mm. and just it was, it was I think an interesting moment. I, I think you were the probably the first to appreciate how, what a significant project it was. Um, and both your critique of the building and, as, and the building have stood up remarkably well, um, given that intervening 20 years. Have you, has anything changed your mind about the building, or have you had anything to add to what you thought about it 20 years ago? No, no, I, 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 I don't think so. But I, I, I wanted to make some comment this evening about how important this book is and, and how um, I'd like to thank Jim Layton and Chris Fogel, Fogel. Fogel um, for it. And, but more important than that, I, I think this company and this occasion, a huge thank you to Ian and Mark Swinnerton um, for supporting what I describe as the other British architecture represented by the Earl in this book. Um, and I think I, since stepping down uh, from architecture today, and I found the Anglo version of architecture au aujourd'hui, which I just dawned on you, which is extremely strange to discover that. Um, not that you're a plagiarist. <laughs> no. you know, I found that. And you've now devoted yourself to right angle publishing. And in this, in this endeavor, I believe, um, we have, by way of coincidence, formed a spirit of uh, union with Kenneth Branson's recent book called The Other Modern Architecture, whereby the preceding era, dominated by Mies van der Rohe and Corbusier, to the exclusion of others, and which this follows 
um, uh, which Sandy Wilson's essay of 1995 um, um, entitled The Other Tradition of Modern Architecture. And with this alignment in Cambridge with Alto and Scandinavia, almost totally ignored by Pelser and, and um, Redavalli. And so as part of the sequence of otherness, um, Ian has given a place to the other British architecture, previously dominated by the hegemony of Foster and Rogers and their high-tech brethren. And so this book, and being Ted Cullinan, he is launched next month. Um, with many others to come from Right Angle Press. So please take a book away with you this evening. Several things I know about Eric. Uh, this is a, a little bit of. This goes on. Uh, 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 um, yeah, yeah. Over the mic. Yeah. It's always tempting when students from your school, in, in this case the Royal College of Art under John Miller's professorship, achieve as Eric has done success and celebrity and to then claim them as your students. In Eric's case, I think this should be more accurately attributed to Dalibor Vesely and Peter Carl, who Eric joined later at the AA before teaching with them at Cambridge. Is, is Peter Carl here? Peter couldn't make it. I mean, oh, he's, he, he, had a, he had another I mean, event. I yeah, Dalibor um, can't yeah. make it, but uh, Peter Carl. They're here in spirit. In spirit, in spirit, yeah. Dalibor's here in spirit. I retain a lasting memory of Eric at the Royal College when my friend Leon Creer had been invited to run a visiting critic studio at the height of the Kulo Creer celebrity on the reconstruction of the European city. Creer's intervention on Ferda's Barcelona grid was a popular and well-attended studio. And much to our surprise, Eric declined to, part, to participate. Eric the outside, I'm coming back to the point I've made, not wishing to be drawn comfortably into the fold, but with a healthy wish to avoid conformity. This example by much of his production. Eric's book is concerned with the office building as a city type and its essential relationship to place. I think we've dwelt, dwelt with that. Ken Frampton reminds us in his essay on the building we are presently in, that Eric has promoted a pro-urban cause with seven to 10 story buildings that support the streets and squares of the existing city. Until now, um, he has avoided the anti-urban tendencies of the object fixated very tall structures that presently disfigure the city of London and the River Thames with their greedy bulk and silly nicknames. I was invited by Ian in 2003, we've done this one 19 years ago, to review Eric's 30 Finsbury Square, having only recently attended a student review for commercial office building in Midtown Manhattan, where Aaron Cahoon dismissed, as, dismissed the project as 90 to 95% real estate and 5% architecture. I therefore approach the writing of this project with some caution. For those who might have read my review of this heroic load-bearing stone facade on the London Square, you will note Eric broke the mold and got into double figures. I quote from my last paragraph, quote, overall number 30 Finsbury Square is successful in significantly raising the percentage for architecture above Cahoon's rather pessimistic ratio. This has achieved initially by a tour de force in the production and achievement of the facade, and then by working through the big idea so that it raises the quality of life in the workplace itself. Bravo, Eric. Huge thanks. Edward, um, massive thank you from, from not just 20 years ago, but kind of 40 years ago for all your help and inspiration, really. And uh, to Ian and Chris and Mark, um, 
for this, uh, for, for your efforts and persistence. Thank you. Thanks to everyone. Let, 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 it's, it's getting a bit serious, so I think we, we need to break out. So, but thank you all for coming. And I'd just like to say um, that though maybe the name, the focus is, um, is on, on myself, I absolutely mean it's a brilliant team through all those years, um, probably at the top of which is Robert Kennett. Um, but many, many others, Nick Jackson, who isn't here, um, uh, and, and now a great, uh, it's a wonderful, I, you know, when you walk into an architecture, uh, the studio in a school of architecture, you're going to feel, you know, it's your place or not. Uh, that's my view. And I, nothing has changed for me. Walking into our studio still uh, it gives a huge buzz, and I hope that that's part of everyone else there because it's just a great thing to do. And uh, thank you, thank you for coming. Um, and everyone has a, a, a copy of the book to pick up. So wonderful to see everyone. Thank you.